All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Serving the Whole Household Through Community Partnerships. I see people are still dialing in, so I'll give us a couple seconds for everyone to get online, um, and I'll go over some housekeeping information first. All attendees are in listen-only mode, so we cannot hear you or see you. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself, you can go ahead and take advantage of the chat function on Zoom webinar. Um, keep in mind that some that our default setting is to all panelists. So if you want to introduce yourself to everyone on the call today, please check all panelists and attendees. Um, I will be sending out a recording of today's slides um, and today's webinar to anyone who registered. Um, so you can expect that in your inbox. And I saw we have a question. Is there a call in number for audio? If you click on the um, there's a little phone um, button on Zoom, and if you click the down arrow there and hit um, call in via phone, then it will give you the phone numbers there. Um, I'm really, really excited to bring to you today's content. We have some amazing speakers and an amazing lineup here. Um, this is a topic that when we first did our non-congregate, um, our first non-congregate meals webinar, we pulled the audience there and asked what people wanted to talk about in future webinars, and this was the second most rated topic. So we know that you guys all on the call are doing such an amazing job um, at feeding kids in your community, whether it's a school or a nonprofit, a food bank that you work for, um, and we all know what a tremendous need there is today um, in light of COVID. And so I know that this is a topic that's top of mind is how can we not just serve the kids who we reach, um, but how can we also um, reach out and serve their families? And how can we partner with people in our community who we might not currently be working with to ensure that we're serving the whole household and not just filling kids' bellies? So we have some great um, speakers, again, who are gonna walk you through how they are serving their whole community. Um, and we, I'm going to take us to the agenda here. First, we're going to have um, a colleague from United Way 211 who operates the two, National 211 service and is going to talk to you all about how that works and what families are calling for in COVID, during COVID-19 um, during this pandemic. And you can think about how you might work with 211 or leverage that hotline to the families that you serve. Um, we'll pause for some Q&A for Rachel, and then we're going to get into a case study from Charlotte, North Carolina. So we have um, someone from School Nutrition Services on the phone who is going to talk through the meal service out of Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. And we also have um, the Community Partnerships Director from Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools talking about how they build partnerships with other community members to really, again, serve the whole household and work with other community partners to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all the families in their community. And we also are pleased to have someone from Our Bridge for Kids, which is a nonprofit group in Charlotte, North Carolina, that works specifically with immigrant families, talking about how they've partnered with Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools um, and how they are using their meal service to reach the families that they are not serving in their after school program at this time. Um, so again, really excited to bring you this content and please go ahead and use the Q&A section as you have questions today. So please put questions in the Q&A box and use the chat for general comments if you'd like to introduce yourself or um, want to share something about what you're doing in your community. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel Krausman, who is again the Senior Director at two, at, for 211 at United Way Worldwide. And Rachel's team leads and supports more than 240 organizations that provide 2 on one services in the U.S. And she works to develop and scale innovative programs, establish national partnerships, facilitate knowledge sharing, and increase public awareness and utilization of this critical service. 2 on one is available to 95% of the U.S. population, and it's a really critical resource for people in need, um, especially those impacted by disasters, especially during COVID-19. Um, and so we're really excited to have her on today to share those insights. Prior to joining United Way, um, Rachel led the nas led National Youth Disaster Preparedness Programs at American Red Cross. So lots of great experience. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Rachel. Awesome. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. It's so wonderful to be on this call with all of you. I had no idea that a gathering of 
um, all the folks working in uh, school and food services existed. So this is really cool. Um, and I am grateful for the opportunity. Emily read through a couple um, just overall stats about 211. So I'm going to share pretty briefly an overview of the 211 service. I'm hoping that many of you are already familiar with 211, maybe even use 211 locally in some of your work. Um, and then want to touch on a couple different projects and collaborations we're currently leading or supporting locally um, that may be interesting for you either to connect with or to talk about launching in your own communities um, as you look to serve uh, children and their families uh, during this time and, and going on uh, beyond COVID if we, if we get there. Um, so Emily, you can go ahead to the next slide. So basically, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with 211, it is a service similar to 311 or even 911, whereby someone can simply dial the 211 number and you'll be connected with a local specialist who works in one of our 211 agencies, which are either nonprofit agencies, some of which are United Ways, and in some cases, government agencies. Um, those specialists are very highly trained to handle not only crises, but also help people navigate to available resources and services to meet basically any need they may have. Um, we maintain really robust databases of community services and resources that the 2 in 1 specialists use to help people find um, anything uh, that's available to them to meet a need, whether it's food or financial assistance or employment assistance um, and everything in between. The next slide, Emily. Awesome. Uh, so the 2 in 1 service has officially only been around for a little over 20 years. It was, the number was actually set aside by the FCC in 2000, um, but it's based on really almost centuries of 1-800 number referrals or um, people in communities who had lists of services that they helped people find. Uh, and it just is that we got an easy to remember number about 20 years ago. Um, as Emily mentioned, 95, close to 96% of the U.S. population can access 211, so that means they can dial 211 from a cell phone or a landline and they'll get a local specialist. Um, and most 211s are available 24-7 and can also assist in 180 different languages through a combination of bilingual staff and translation services. Next one. So this is just a map of population coverage so you can see where your state is on the map. Um, as you can see, most states have 100% coverage. We do have a few states with whom we are working very hard to get the rest of their um, residents' coverage with 211 services. Um, but in most places, you can dial 211 and reach a specialist, including Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Alaska, um, and the District of Columbia. Next slide. This overwhelming map is just an illustration to show you how many individual 211 agencies there are across the country. So as you can see, in some states there are many. In other states, there's a single 211 that covers the whole state. Um, but regardless, wherever you are, there is an agency with whom you can partner and learn more about how the 211 service might be able to help expand your assistance or help those that you also serve. Next one. So uh, the next slide is just a few examples of um, types of calls that 211s receive. There are really no uh, calls that are the same, if you want to jump, Emily, to the next one. Um, but like I said, typically we are helping people who need some type of uh, basic or essential services like food, housing, um, people who are facing eviction, who may need help finding um, health care when they don't have health insurance. But we do a lot of work responding to crises and disasters as well. So 211s actually respond to um, close to 200,000 calls from people who are experiencing suicidal ideation. Um, we support a lot of people who are looking to escape uh, domestic violence situations. Um, and we also are typically, 211 is the uh, go-to information line during natural disasters and, and the aftermath to um, connect people to disaster services like shelters and emergency food, um, and then obviously to help with the longer-term recovery as well. Next slide. 
These are just a few numbers, again, to illustrate um, some of the impact. So as you can see here, the network, so those 200 agencies, handle about 11 million uh, phone calls per year um, and make about 14 million connections to services. Again, as you can see, things related to health, homelessness, and food are definitely our top um, referrals, but then we also help with financial assistance, job coaching, um, finding child care, and then, like I said, um, different types of crisis and, and disaster-oriented resources. Next slide. Awesome. So this is uh, some of the stuff that we get really excited about. So 211s at their core connect people, obviously, to resources and services in the local community. Um, but over the past several years, many 211s have really expanded their services, both in collaboration with community partners and also just with funding from grants, contracts, philanthropy, um, to provide more direct support. So these are just four of many examples of ways that 211s um, actually collaborate with others and or do coordinated services um, that can help other agencies. So for example, there are about 50 211s that serve as the front door for any homeless shelter in a particular community. So if someone is looking for a shelter, they can contact 211. The 211 can actually um, ask them several questions and then place them in a specific shelter that has a bed available um, and for which they are qualified. Um, 211s also operate a number of specialized hotlines. So everything from uh, a suicide hotline to a uh, most recently in the past couple of years, um, operating a lot of state hotlines to connect people who are struggling with opioid addictions to treatment facilities and treatment options. Um, we also do a lot of outbound programs. So there are 211s that enroll seniors um, or other individuals who live at home alone in a program where they reach out to them regularly and just do a check-in, provide some um, just general emotional support, and then of course can connect them to a service if, if they need something. Um, there's similar programs related to schools. So there are some 2-on-1s that collaborate with their school systems to help parents actually find the school that, that their child um, can go to. They can help register them for schools, so new parents. Um, a lot of 211s oper also operate or help with those summer meal program um, services. So people can call 211 and find their closest summer meal distribution site. Um, we have also 211s, like in Denver, for example, that work with the school system to try and reduce chronic absenteeism among students. So they'll actually do regular outreach to the parents um, or whoever is taking care of those children to make sure that they. Uh, if they need food or they need help paying rent or something else that may be contributing um, to that student being absent more often than not, um, that they can actually help them with that, uh, with that issue. Um, additionally, most 211s, and this is particularly helpful, I think, to this group, um, most 211s have the resource databases that they use to help people on the phone available online or through mobile apps. Um, for anyone. So a person in need can use that, but also a person who is helping a person in need can use those resources to find um, any type of resource or information that, that someone may need um, without having to actually call and talk to 211 if you'd rather just search for it online. Next. And we'll jump ahead. So I just wanted to touch on briefly, since it's um, definitely the obviously the topic of the day, um, what the 2-in-1 network in response to the COVID pandemic has looked like. Um, so 2 has been promoted very heavily in most states by government officials and others as an info line about the virus and also just for general assistance. So call volume across the country has doubled and tripled um, in most places we are hearing the same needs that we usually hear. It's just that we're hearing more of them. So lots and lots of calls from people who are struggling to pay housing and utilities bills. Um, even with the moratoriums placed on evictions, 
people are concerned about when those are lifted um, and they still have to pay electric bills, they need help buying food, um, other things like that. So we are largely handling those basic needs calls, but again, they've basically doubled or tripled um, over what we usually handle. Um, we're also still getting a lot of questions about COVID and certainly for um, healthcare questions uh, related to seeking treatment for people who are uninsured um, and other, other issues like that. Um, and then on our next slide, these are again just a couple examples. Um, don't feel like you need to read all of them. I think the, the slides will be sent out um, later with some of these stories, but just wanted to give um, a, an example of, again, some of the calls that we're handling um, or, or work that we're doing, everything from coordinating food deliveries um, to administering financial assistance that's become available. Um, we're also helping some of the state agencies and state government um, offload some of the calls they're receiving to some of their hotlines. Uh, so lots of different types of calls um, sort of serving as a, a clearinghouse. Next slide. So this program, um, and this is the last thing uh, that I kind of wanted to touch on specifically. This is something we announced only a couple weeks ago. Um, we have a program called Ride United that was launched back um, last year, about a year ago, where several 211s provide free rides, um, free lift rides to eligible clients to help them to get to and from job interviews, grocery stores, um, medical appointments, other essential transportation needs. With the pandemic and the impact on people, um, particularly who lack transportation or who shouldn't um, be out and about grocery shopping or going to a food pantry because they were vulnerable in some way. Um, we've expanded Ride United to now include food delivery. So um, in about 16 markets and soon probably close to 30, 211s and United Ways are actually facilitating food deliveries from food sources to uh, clients. So this is something, um, if it's active or going to be active in a community that you serve, could certainly be a resource for helping get uh, families food that is available to them delivered rather than them having to go wait in a line or pick it up. Um, so really trying to help reduce some of the, the load on the food pantries themselves and also just help people not have to ride you know, three buses to get to the closest food pantry, et cetera. Um, there's a website link there that's just unitedway.org slash ride united and you also again will get the slides with some information so um, certainly happy to connect anyone who is interested in that with their local lead agency if you're not already familiar um, to talk more about how that might be able to help you expand some of the, the food resources that you have and then the next so Next um, couple slides, again, are just like quick shots of the um, website and ways to connect with 211. Um, so actually, if you want to skip ahead, Emily, I'm just cognizant of time. So if you go to 211.org, um, you can actually use the search box to find the contact information for the 211 that covers your area. So if you don't know your local 211 and you don't know who operates it, you can go to 211.org and search by zip code or city and state and it will actually show you the agency and link out to that agency where you can find their online database, you can connect with their staff to talk about partnerships, and you can read more about any specific programs they operate um, that might be beyond the typical 211 service. And then lastly, we do have a COVID-19 page. So again, at 211.org, um, this is where we've tried to consolidate some of the most um, helpful national resources for people. So again, feel free to bookmark and reference this site um, if it's helpful to, to you or anyone that you've served. Thank you so much, Rachel. This is so much wonderful information. Um, we had a question come in the question box. How do you register the services that the organizations on the phone are providing with the 211 hotline in their area, for example, meal sites? Um, how, are, how are you getting that data? And is there an opportunity for people to submit their data? 
That's an awesome question. So each 211 manages that locally right now. So the best way to do that is to find the 211 that serves your area using 211.org. Um, and on each of their websites, they will have either a form or some type of process that says, if you're a community agency, do this to register your program information with us. Um, if you serve a large area where there are multiple 211s, we can usually help connect you to all of them at once. Um, so anyone is welcome to email me and I can connect you through my team. Um, but if you're in a, a particular county or a city area, um, definitely go directly to your local 211 and they each have, um, like I said, an online form or some other process where they would love to have that information so that they can help direct people to you. Awesome. Thanks so much. And I think you answered the last question of how can people see where they might be able to partner with that ride service that, that 2 on one is um, piloting and expanding. And I believe that's also by going to search and connect with your local 2 on one to see if it's available in their area. Yes, definitely. Um, and people can also contact me if they are specifically interested in the transportation or the food deliveries. Um, it's only available in a few markets, like I said, so far. So um, we can definitely let you know whether or not it's there. We'll be pushing out a, a list soon as well. Um, and then I, I saw one last question in the chat. Did you want me to answer that one, Emily? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the coverage map that I showed earlier in terms of the distribution, that is a great question. Um, there are a few places where it's largely a funding issue. Um, so obviously it, it costs money for us to operate 211s and different agencies are funded in different ways. Um, so some of these states like Montana and South Dakota have a really great 211 that covers the majority of the state, but they haven't raised sufficient funding yet to provide ongoing coverage for everywhere in the state. Um, 211s are largely funded through uh, phil philanthropic dollars and then state um, grants and contracts. So they're working on that. Um, the same is true in California. This map is actually a few weeks old. Um, Arkansas just turned on 211 coverage for the whole state. So 211 in Arkansas is available. Um, the only caveat I will say is the major population gap in that 95% getting to 100%. And as demonstrated on this map, is that the metro area of Chicago, so the city of Chicago and Cook and DeKalb counties, um, do not have 211 service and have slowly been working on it for a very long time. So the majority of um, actually that number gap is a little bit uh, mis um, a little bit misleading because it is largely that that giant population in the Chicago metro area. Awesome. Woo, we clicked out here. Let's get back in. Um, thank you so much, Rachel. For folks who want to get in contact with you, could you share in the chat how they might be able to get in touch with you? That was the last question that came into the question box. Absolutely. I will put that in the chat right Thank now. Thank you. Great. All right. Um, thanks again to, to Rachel. And we're going to kind of transition gears here. Um, and feel free to reach out to Rachel with the contact information that she's putting in the chat box. Um, we are really excited to feature um, kind of a case study from Charlotte, which is in Mecklenburg County in North Carolina, of the school system and community partners who are working there together to serve the whole household. So our partners, our panelists who are going to be speaking today, first we have Susan Argenti. Um, she is the wellness and marketing specialist for Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. And she has over six years of experience as a dietitian in nutrition and more than seven years in working with dietary management and healthcare. She has a bachelor's in nutrition from Rutgers and a marketing degree from Florida Atlantic University. And when she isn't working, she stays busy with her 17 year old son, Jack, who will be a high school senior this upcoming fall. And we also have Dr. Rosana Saladin Zubero with us, who serves as the assistant director of community partnerships for Charlotte Mecklenburg School District. Dr. Saladin is a Latina leader who is passionate about education and invested in community development. Dr. Saladin is from Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic and inspired by her mother's insistence on the importance of education and caring for those around you, Dr. Saladin received her bachelor degree in marketing 
from the Pontificia Universidad Católica Madre y Maestra in Santo Domingo, a Master's in Arts in Commerce from Otaru University of Commerce in Japan, and a PhD from the Institute on Family and Neighborhood Life at Clemson. Dr. Saladin has years of experience in public health and in working with the Latino community specifically, um, from working in the Dominican Republic on USAID HIV AIDS initiatives, to working in the Carolinas to build the social and economic capital of the Latino community in the US. Dr. Saladin Zubero's main passion is to work on behalf of children and families and as a proud Latina supporting the Latin American community here. And last but certainly not least, we have Salma Villarreal, and she is the program and engagement coordinator at Our Bridge for Kids. She's a first generation American from Durango, Mexico, born in Chicago and raised in Charlotte. She began her work in the community when she was in high school, advocating for the release of a fellow classmate who was detained by ICE. Once graduating high school, she worked for the Latin American Coalition as a civic engagement coordinator. The summer before joining Arbridge, she was a site administrative assistant for Freedom Schools. And in this role, she found that she was able to create a safe, inclusive, and loving environment for children of all backgrounds and their families and realized that this was something that she really wanted to continue doing and strive for. She found her way to Arbridge in 2018 and couldn't be more thrilled to working, to continue working in her community in Charlotte. So I'd like to turn it over to Susan to talk about the school nutrition efforts at Charlotte um, to serve the whole household. Susan? Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me be a part of this webinar. Due to the pandemic, um, I'm sure as everyone can imagine, uh, school nutrition programs across this country have been hit hard and possibly certain parts of this program will be uh, changed for an unspecified period of time. Um, but for the next five to eight minutes, I wanna highlight the positive outreach um, CMS School Nutrition has had in working with our incredible community partnerships in feeding children throughout the Mecklenburg communities. And then at the end, I just wanted to spotlight our two award-winning summer meals programs. So you can go to, next slide. So this is how uh, we normally operated uh, prior to March um, with our meal service. CMS has 175 operating kitchens. We do about 140,000 meals daily, um, which includes breakfast, lunch, our after-school programs. Uh, 56 schools and then our supper programs, we have about 70 um, of the supper programs. We employ 1,400 employees, we have 70 CEP schools, and we are the largest summer feeding program in North Carolina, which includes not only our hot sites, includes our picnic program and mobile meals, which I'll speak about towards the end. Next slide. So as of March 16th, um, this is how we've looked. We've dropped from 175 operating kitchens down to 67 um, for a drive up, grab and go um, service to our parents coming to pick up for the students. Right now we're averaging about 40,000 meals served daily and that's just breakfast and lunch. Uh, to date, we've our meals are about, 1.3 million that we've served since March 16th. So, um, and that's employing 300 employees. So our managers is a picture. Uh, this is just the new look of school nutrition employees and um, they're incredible incredible managers just going out every single day and, and feeding the kids. So next slide. So what's working for us during this time? Um, like I said, our a lot of volunteers have stepped up as far as community partners coming and picking up meals, churches in the areas, our sheriff's offices pick up um, at several of the sites, local organizations, we can't speak enough, we couldn't have done this without them to feed as many um, children throughout the district. Um, just to, I just wanna mention, just to give you an example, a lot of nonprofits, Pineville uh, neighbor, Neighboring Place, uh, Learning Help Center, Habitat for Humanities, um, Ada Jenkins Center and Neighbor Care Center. These are two huge centers in the north end of Charlotte that have distributed a tremendous amount of meals by coming to um, Blythe and North Mech to pick up the school um, uh, meals. Salvation Army, and then we have the Refugee Support Services, and then Selma's going to speak about um, our bridge where she has come to one of our schools to do that. Uh, the other thing is that our community uh, resources 
have also extended outreach to our 4,000 McKinney Vinto students in the Charlotte um, area, and they not only you know distribute the meals but also um, technology resources. The other feature that is unique to um, CMS is that we have our own warehouse freezer and cooler space for our menu items. Our freezer space is about 10,000 square feet and our cooler space is about 7,000. And by having this, it just puts us in a new, unique situation to where we have a great deal of our menu items already here, um, our entrees and then our produce. So when we are, did, when this did happen to us prior to March, um, we don't have to rely as much on a, a food distributor and it just made it a lot easier for us that we had to pull from. Plus not only that, when we drop from 175 schools down to 67 sites, our director of operation um, and the supervisor team were streamlining inventory and moving it around. So that just made it easier um, for us to get the food out quicker um, to the students. We are transitioning as of next week into our summer feeding, um, and that will run seven weeks. It's about three weeks shorter than our normal um, summer food program, but we will be able to operate our mobile meals program and our picnic site, and the picnic site program is the largest part of our summer program. Next slide. So this, if you back, this is, our managers are unbelievable. We are still able to provide hot and um, cold uh, menu items. With operating under the waivers, we've been able to um, just put out some really, um, not only the food that we have normally through the year, but they've had fun planning some items as well. So this is our entree salads and then our other, um, we do an Asian, and then this is our uh, Sambrosa chicken that we do during the normal school year. You can go to the next slide. So this is a mobile site, an emergency mobile site that came about when we first shut down in the north end. There was a push to get a mobile route out into this area. And um, the reason why we were able to move and transition as easily is because this is a snapshot of our picnic site that happens during the um, summertime. So this, uh, we were we had about 10 sites that we went, we took the bus, and we have refrigerated trucks that followed behind it to hand out the cold items as well. Next slide. Next slide, sorry. And this is, we have uh, 10 uh, refrigerated trucks, and then on the left is we turned the dining room area of a cafeteria into a production site. And then on the right is all, is the, some of the community partners coming to pick up the food. Next slide. So this is our drive ups. For the next couple of slides is the drive up sites. This is where the parents would come and we would just operate pretty much in the bus lots. And the managers would have the food ready and for a period of about two hours, they would just come through nonstop picking up the meals. Good. And this is just another one at all the different sites that we have. Like I said, our, our sheriff's department, if you could back it up, and we have our own CMS uh, police um, station, and they're just, they come out and they're, they get involved with the kids. And a lot of the managers were lucky is when we went down to the sites that we went down to, most of the managers stayed on and they know all the kids, so they would know everyone coming through. So we still did, you know, tried to keep the excitement up and, and they would be able to, um, interact with the children and they, you know, it was fun. I mean, it's really cool to be out on these sites picking up the food. Next slide. And this is just more. Uh, we had one of our um, community partners, Food Lion, um, they donated a tremendous amount to us as well. So they gave us the bags and whatnot and, and they were a big part of that, along with um, our second harvest food bank, um, and just the, the churches were unbelievable, too. You can go to the next one. It's just more. I just thought, I love the pictures. We had managers sending in so many pictures. So when Emily said she wanted, I said, I'm good with pictures. All right, so this is the two, these are two uh, programs that um, are just have been really excelling over several years. The mobile meals program, it operates 
um, Monday through Friday. It normally is a night and week program. And on the next slide that shows after I finish, she, those are all the pictures on the left. Um, over the past five years, they have helped go into the communities where kids don't have transportation to get to our hot sites. So we literally have a van, a bus, and the bus access a dining room, and we have activities and physical activity, and it's they come out um, and they just go into the neighborhoods. We've had the same managers for the past couple of years, and from the very first year, say about 8,000 meals. Last year we did about 40,000. So um, this is just a really cool program that's actually starting up next um, week. And two years ago, um, the executive director, Kathy Bean, uh, received a grant from um, a Dollar General store. And we had a partner prior that was promising pages, and they came out and read on the, the buses. So we went ahead and used the money to create our own mobile library where the kids could come on and check out books and read and just to do our part with increasing literacy in the summertime. Um, so because of that, I submitted this program both for a USBA Best Practice Award and then going the distance for the mobile meals. So this is an incredible um, program and, and just we're very fortunate to have this. The other program, this has been in operation for 20 years. This has been the backbone of our summer program. It operates out of one elementary school, it's, um, and it is set up just like you saw those pictures earlier. But this program, you have to, there's an application to it. It pretty much is, um, you have to have refrigeration on site. So it's a lot of our um, houses of worship, wise, daycares. And um, just up until this summer, we also fed this summer program at Airedale um, Statesville. And this program, just with all the meals that it brings in um, just last year, was close to 91,000 just in lunch and almost 56,000, I mean 56,000 in breakfast. So this site um, is another one where it starts early and the, the trucks come in, refrigerator trucks load up and they move out. And um, as another thing they also do is nutrition teaching too. We have interns that come and they go out and to some of these um, sites and they'll teach healthy eating. Um, so that's been a really cool thing as well. And then they also just won a superior site award um, for the summer site. So we are doing our part. We're really happy and just proud of all our cafeteria managers and workers and staff. And we couldn't do this without them. And as you can see on the left with this page, this is how it pretty much looks, the mobile meals. You have a van, a, ta you know, a table, and the, the meals come out. You're there about 25 minutes. The kids take the meal and then they go on the bus and eat it or they'll eat around. Um, these are just all the kids lining up and then, you know, some are And on our routes, we also have CM, our CMS police that come, you know, with us and do everything. And then on the right, this is just how our production site, um, just a tremendous amount of meals. And, and anytime anyone wants to come out, you know, I, or we can send them information, we'd be more than happy to um, show them around. But thank you for the time to promote the program. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to email. Great. Thank you so much, Susan. I mean, what an amazing program. And clearly, it's award winning. Um, you guys are just doing such great work now and looking to the summer. Um, thank you so much for sharing. And we do have questions for you, but we're going to hand it over first to Rosanna and save questions for the end. So welcome, Rosanna. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I am Rosanna. I am the Director of um, Strategic Partnership and Engagement for CMS. And you can put the next slide right away if you want. My department, what, what we do every day 24-7 during this, the regular school year is um, to build relationships with the community and create capacity for families so they can uh, be deployed as agents of change at all times. So we in our department believe that all students and families deserve access to higher education and that they can have a positive out outcome in life. That, that is our why in the department that, um, that I lead right now. What we do, as I said, we build capacity, we do community outreach, and we build community partnerships. So 
um, pretty much what, what we have created during the six, seven years that this department has been in operation with CMS, we have created a network of, of supporters and partners um, for us to deploy to support the goals and needs, the goals of our district and the needs of our families and students. So it wasn't very difficult for us when the COVID uh, pandemic emergency um, support was in operation back in March for us to start deploying these partnerships and these supporters. It was very humbling, I am not going to lie, it was very humbling to see how the community corralled immediately to support education. I was getting hundreds and hundreds of uh, phone calls and emails a day of different partners, different um, organizations uh, offering to support in any kind of way. You can put the next slide. So with, with that, this is, this is my department. We have um, 15 people in our department and what they support, we have divided it to support each learning community. So each learning community has a team of either partnership uh, coordinators or family engagement specialists or a combination of both. So this is the support that we have on a regular basis. Now, the next slide. What happened during the pandemic response was that the whole county was organized in what it was, it is still called right now because we're still in that operation, called the Charmec Response Coalition. And it is a coalition of different organizations that are operating under VOWAD, which is an arm of FEMA. BOAD stands for Voluntary Organizations Active, uh, Activated in Disaster or Active in Disaster, but it's, it's an arm of FEMA and it operates under the Emergency Operations Center. So all of these organizations that you see here, immediately, as soon as the state closed, um, they started meeting together two, day, two times a week, regular meetings, but we were all based at the Emergency Operations Center, meeting and strategizing on how to support different situations that were happening. But again, most of these organizations were already CMS partners because of the work that we do on a regular basis. So thanks to this operation, it was easier for us to in, in close collaboration with our nutrition department, which was our production and um, creating all of the great meals for, for our students and families, we were then coordinating all of the community support to outreach those families um, who could not make it to the site, uh, who had situations either because of disability or transportation that they could not go to or have access to meals. So we started deploying all of these groups and under this Charmec response group, we had access to more than um, 210 organizations locally and a pool of six, seven, eight hundred people at one point in time um, volunteering, volunteer, registered to volunteer and support education. So um, in, co in close cooperation with the nutrition department, we were also getting different needs from our families, from our, from our 211 call that was, that was being funneled through also our VOAT group from our own call center and from our organizations. We were all getting the needs, channeling, strategizing, and deploying the volunteers. And I know there's, there was a question about it in, in the Q&A section that I'm gonna address more in depth as we move on. You can share the next slide. So thanks to that quick response and the, the organization that was already put in place with the county and the quick response and relationship that we have established, previously established with these organizations, um, we were able to create uh, the following process. So one of the members that you saw in one of the previous slides will identify a need uh, from a from student or a family. So it could, it could either still in operation, it could either be a CPFE team, a nutrition team, 
or any of the calls from the ombudsman office or the call center. So we identify the need, the need was sent to my department. After we had it in our department, we identified which area was this family or student and which need this was corresponding to. Was it a connectivity need? Was it a meal need? A, was it a, a, a health need? Whatever kind of need it was, it was being funneled in my department by the team. And after we identified the need and the area, then we went back to our, our partnership network, the Charlotte Mecklen Mecklenburg Response Area, and asked them to identify an organization or a volunteer to help uh, handle the need. And mainly where related to food and basic needs and connectivity, but we were able also to identify other needs that different families were having. So when we had, at one point in time, and that was another question there in the, in the box, at one point in time, we had about 160 individuals who called our offices or nutrition asking for support with delivery of meals to their homes because they were lacking transportation or had disability. Because of, um, of FERPA, we could not dis disclose that information to anyone that um, was not allowed to have the family information. So we had the need and we had volunteers, but we couldn't connect. But again, we relied a lot in our community partners. And what we did, we created a partnership with one of the organizations who were already having a survey in the community and families were voluntarily signing up with them to get meals delivered. And once families were already getting that information, giving that information um, to the third party, that information was coming back to us and we were deploying volunteers. So at one point in time during these, um, these three months that we've been in this emergency deployment uh, program, we've, we, we were delivering meals to over 3,000 people a day, either by one-on-one -on -one delivery to families and homes or neighborhoods or hotels or apartment complex. We were identifying, identifying pockets of needs through the partnership team and fulfilling that need with meals delivered and pre prepared and packed by our nutrition department and deployed by volunteers. Isn't that wonderful? It was, it was a whole community supporting these, um, these need in, in, in our community. We were also able to partner with CIS, which is a national organization. And very, very early on, we called them and we said, we need you to take on our McKinney Vinto students. And they came on board and they were the one who embraced that group, which at that time was about 4,000 students, but we could only identify roughly 500 that were living in hotels. So CIS, through partnerships with the Sheriff's Office, was serving CMS meals, picking it up every day and delivering to our McKinney Vinto students. So I say all that to say there's much more. I only have a couple of minutes to share with you all, but all of these is just an example of how important is developing partnership and relationships early on. It is very difficult to call a partner last minute and say, hey, I need you right now. But if you spend the time during the school year to build those relationships, to tell them what your school district goals are, to tell them about your families. Once you have an emergency situation like this, it's a lot more, it's a lot easier to go back to them and say, I need you. This, this is the time when I need you. You can put the next slide really quick. Um, it's, it's a short one. So through this process and since March, we, there was one point in time, as I said, we were serving an average of 3,000 individuals daily, supported, supported with CMS meals distributed by community volunteers. Um, about 61 community sites we were, including hotels and apartment complexes. We were pro, um, 
providing and deploying 4,500 weekend backpacks thanks to the partnership with Second Harvest Food Bank at each um, meal distribution site. We also had a partnership with Promising Pages and Classroom Central to provide books and classroom supplies. We also had different partners coming on, on board to provide hygiene kits and cleaning supplies. And um, we also had other partnerships that were a little bit more scattered, but they were identified and provide bags meals for the families. So we had families with seven students in one home and one adult. And we could only serve the students, we could not serve the adults with the CMS meals. So we were, we were complementing those gaps in the families and the meal continuity with different partnerships in the community. Um, that's, in a nutshell, there's a lot more that I wish I could share with you all, I'll be glad to share. But in a nutshell, that's what um, that's what we do. This is my contact information. Mia, uh, Pia, I'm sorry, Emily, <laughs> if you can, uh, I know I responded to two questions in the Q&A. When you're ready to do that, I'll be glad to respond to that as well. Thank you for having me here and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you so, so much. Um, that was incredible to learn about and really great to see the complimentary services come together. Um, we also have one of the CMS partners that Rosanna was talking about with us. Um, we have right. Alma Villarreal. Yes. And this Do you is want to one. Her, Rosanna? I'm sorry, I'm just so excited about our breach because this <laughs> one of my favorite partners please don't be don't be jealous but um, <laughs> I hold our reach for kids because I saw them when when they were still uh, growing and, and and being created so and it was one of the partners who came on board immediately I don't think we have even completed the meal distribution sites when our I reach out to our bridge seal by Facebook there um, executive director by Facebook, y'all. That's what I'm talking about, relationship. And I reached out to her and I said, I need you, I need you to do this. Will you be willing to pick up meals? Well, end of the story, they were picking up about 550 meals every single day just from CMS sites to support our refugee and immigrant students. So I am so, so proud and honored to introduce Sama Villarreal from our Bridge for Kids, one of the best partners that we have. Thank you, Rosana. Thank you for that introduction. That, that means a lot to us. Um, so our bridge is actually an after school program that works with immigrant and refugee children in uh, east side of Charlotte. Uh, we have about 150 kids, about 100 families in our program, and we offer not just after school program, we also do a lot of like mental health support to our families and communities, a lot of cultural events to raise awareness about the diversity of East Charlotte. Um, we do tons of, I, I said, events, we do mental health support, we do advocacy in the community, um, as well as we have ESL classes for the parents. Um, and just still trying to continue our reach and, and engage in the community. But since the very beginning of COVID-19 and the whole situation that was happening, um, the staff at Arbridge, we were very intentional about making sure that we were listening to our families uh, and centering their needs into our work and not centering our work into their lives um, and making sure that we were ensuring that our uh, relief efforts were exactly catered to what they needed. And the main thing that we kept hearing from our families, because right away, the first, the first, the day after, you know, CMS announced that they were going to close their schools, we called all of our families and we had a couple of questions. And the first one was, how are you doing? <laughs> like, how do you feel? Because we know that with everything that was going on, the uncertainty, um, you know, not knowing where the, their kids were going to get fed, um, we knew all of that was really important to make sure that we were, we were being responsive to them. So we asked them, you know, how are you feeling? We asked them also, what, what do you think you're going to need or what do you need right now? What are you seeing in the future your needs are going to be? And a lot of them at first were like, we're fine. We called um, a couple of days afterwards as well. And a lot of the family said, you know, our kids, they go to school and they eat breakfast and lunch there. And then they go to our bridge and they eat dinner and a snack there. So all of their kids are usually coming home fully fed. And now all of a sudden they're having to feed some families up to five, six kids 
three meals a day plus snacks, that's a huge strain on a family that they never accounted for. And so we knew that food insecurity became a huge thing for our families at that moment. And Emily, you can go to the next, the next slide, I think our relief. So um, as you can see, Friday, March 13th was, our, was the last day of school in CMS. And then the 17th is when CMS started the grab and go program. On Wednesday, March 18th, which was five days later, we sent our staff with one of our vans to go pick up 40 lunches and breakfasts to just go take into the neighborhood and see who, see who needed food the most. Um, and we saw that, you know, they were going within a second. And every single day people were asking us like, hey, can you bring us meals? We also saw that some kids, it was, you know, they were sending their kids to go pick up the meals at the school and they were having to cross really busy roads and we knew that it just wasn't safe and it also wasn't accessible for a lot of families. And so we knew that, you know, we can't have our after school program right now. We can't do the therapy, the counseling group sessions, the ESL classes for parents had to be closed, but this is something that we could do. Um, and so we started working with CMS and partnering with people, amazing people like Rosana to pick up more and more lunches. And, you know, eventually we ended up picking over a thousand lunches and breakfasts a day from CMS and distributing them into the community. Um, and then obviously that just wasn't happening on the weekends because it's Monday through Friday initiative. And so we partnered with uh, local organizations in Charlotte, like the Migrant Assistance Project, as well as uh, United Methodist Church, of Charlotte to begin offering weekend meals and grocery distribution. And so loaves and fishes were donating, you know, um, leftover, not leftover, but things that they couldn't give out that were non-perishable um, to our families and so, or that were perishable to our families. So we started distributing those groceries as well and also doing, you know, partner with Migrant Assistance Project to create meals for our families on the weekends. And so making sure that they're receiving meals every single day, not just Monday through Friday. And then um, in April 27, on April 27th, we received funds from United Way to begin offering dinners to our families. And this way we weren't, we were able to just not offer meals just to our children, but to the parents as well. For so long at Arbridge, our efforts have always been to make sure that, you know, our parents are taken care of as well and we're not considering them as an afterthought and that they're just as important to us as our children are and that they feel just as included in our work. Um, and so being able to offer the parents dinner as well was so important because it, it, it didn't feel like the Arbridge way to just bring breakfast and lunches to the kids. And so this way we were able to take care of the whole family. And that, that was really important to us. So we started offering dinners that were culturally relevant um, with businesses that are local to East Charlotte and owned by immigrants and refugees. Um, and that was all possible because United Way was able to give us the funds to you know, use at our own discretion and pick which restaurants we wanted to. So we started ordering from restaurants, you know, Middle Eastern restaurants. Um, one of our caterers is a Mexican American woman. Um, yes, and so as you can see here, we have 5,600 breakfasts and lunches distributed every single week. Um, and we have about 2,200 family style dinners delivered. And as you can see, we have Lashish Kebab, Charlotte Community Kitchen, Why Not Pizza is owned by an incredible Mexican American couple. We also receive uh, meals from local like Indi Indian and um, Nepali organizations. They sometimes do meals for our families. So making sure that we're also, you know, giving our families meals that are culturally relevant. We also know that during this time was Ramadan. Um, eat. And so a lot of our families, you know, they were breaking fast with delicious food that's culturally relevant to them. And that meant a lot to them as well. Um, and continuing to just do the uh, meal packages on the weekends, um, as well as 50 grocery bags delivered each week to members of the community and continue doing that. Um, that's we still decided to keep doing our after school programming through virtual tutoring. So we created educational scheme boxes for our students. We include arts in that because we think it's an incredible, important component of education. Um, and so we were sending home art supplies, materials to make robots, um, materials to do science experiments, and we would get on live with them and do with it. Yeah. Um, we started doing as well as mental health check-ins with our families. And so volunteer counselors and um, therapists uh, checking in with our families, we saw that stress and anxiety was, the levels of stress and anxiety were going up increasingly high in our, in our parents. And we know that that is just gonna trickle down and affect the students. And so addressing it with our parents is really important. And we have seen uh, really positive feedback from that. These are not necessarily therapy or counseling sessions. It's just therapists and counselors that check in with the parents, say, how are you doing? You know, give them some ways to manage and cope with stress and anxiety and all the uncertainty that's going on. Um, as well as, you know, continuing offering resources to our families, uh, making sure a lot of our families are undocumented and so they don't receive help from the government 
or the stimulus package. And so making sure that we are supporting them as much as possible is so critical in our work. Um, and then census assistance to make sure that everyone is counted for in Charlotte. Um, I think the citizenship question threw a lot of our immigrant neighbors off. And so spreading accurate information that is accessible to them and in their language, as well as translating. In the beginning, we spent thousands of dollars translating um, a lot of the stuff that's accessible in English and Spanish, but wasn't as accessible in Vietnamese or Nepali or all these other languages. So um, that's some of the few efforts that we've worked on. And yes, educational enrichment. Um, yeah, no, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> I um, didn't mean to rush you there, Salma, when you were talking about some of the great businesses. I knew they were on the next slide, so I thought you might want to reference them there. Um, thank, you. thank you so much. And we've got lots of questions um, that have come in. Um, we're going to stay on if um, some of the panelists have a moment, so we're going to stay on to answer a couple of these quick questions. Um, I promise you will get a copy of the slides and a recording to your inbox, as well as some of the materials that were mentioned on this call, including some guidance around the mobile meals program and the picnic program. Um, and you have contact information for Rachel in the chat box. Um, so please use those resources. Um, Salma, quick question for you. How many staff and volunteers do you have at Arbridge to do all of this work? We have about, uh, including volunteers, maybe like 35 to 40. It is a bit tricky trying to maintain social distancing and all that. We have a really big space at the center, so we're able to spread everyone out. Um, and we have, they take a lot of our staff and volunteers take their own cars as well as our vans. But yeah, about 35. Um, but and every single day, there's only about two to three people going out into each community to deliver meals. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you. And on the topic of volunteers, um, this one is for both Susan and Salma. Have you experienced staff or volunteer fatigue in this time? Um, it's something that folks on the phone are experiencing. And what strategies do you have to help overcome that? Um, I can speak for school nutrition. The, um, we have definitely a list of employees that we have our our core right now, and then we do uh, cycle them in as far as to cover people, to give them a break. Our volunteers, I was just talking to Kathy this morning, and she was saying that that has slowed up a little bit just, you know, in the, the weeks that it's been going on, but we are still able to, um, you know, provide the meals that they're asking for. So we haven't seen that much of a drop off. These volunteers are incredible. They show up you know, right on time to pick up all the meals and, and, and get them out and distribute it. So not too bad from my our standpoint. I'm not sure about Rosanna, what you want to contribute. Yes, I was going to I was going to echo what you said. Um, I think our volunteers didn't realize that this was going to take three months and beyond. So right about this time, we have a couple of them that are, are experiencing a little bit of fatigue, but the group is so robust right now that even if, you have, if we have a group of volunteers that are experiencing that, they can fill it up with other volunteers that are already registered. And um, the other question that was there too was about reaching out to some of the students that don't have internet of good connection. That is a real problem that CMS has, that the information, the content information that the parents uh, provided at the beginning of the school year, a lot of them are, are not working and we cannot reach out to the students. But what we do have here is a, a robust community and a team of people who have been able to get those contacts and get to the families directly and I'm telling you, it's over 200 partners that are in the community serving with this, um, serving these families on a daily basis. So if there's a need that we cannot get to, they collect the need and let us know so we can serve the need the best that we can. So that's one of the strategies that we use. Just use community development and community outreach and community organization to reach out to the grassroots and students that otherwise you cannot reach by internet and um, regular methods of communication. 
and I can I can add to that as well um, to both of them. We we have obviously seen a lot of um, fatigue, and I don't I don't I wouldn't necessarily describe it as fatigue, but more so um, like. It, it's, it is heavy work, you know, the uncertainty about what your students are going through, not seeing them, everything being completely different, um, as well as our staff is 70% people of color. And so they have a lot of shared experiences with our students that we know can be triggering. Um, and so one of the most important things was always also checking in with our staff. So we do weekly check-ins with them. Um, we have a lot of appreciation effort. So actually during all of this, it was our uh, after school appreciation uh, professionals week. So we were able to do a lot of things to make them feel better, but we also know that, right, those little things aren't enough sometimes. And so we do have, you know, we partner with local therapists to offer therapy to our staff if they need it for at low cost or free, um, as well as for our volunteers, you know, checking in with them, making sure they're not taking on as too much that they can handle um, and just trying to always keep, in, keep into account our staff's mental health as well as our volunteers. Um, and as for the internet question, a lot of our, a lot of teachers at the school have actually reached out to us and said, hey, I get, can't get in contact with so-and-so and so-and-so. And so we actually would go to their house um, or, you know, there was this one family where I reached out to a neighbor that I knew was close friends with her and she let me know that they actually moved to Greensboro. And so just, I know personally, Arbridge, we work very closely with the teachers to also um, make sure that, you know, if they can't get in contact with a student, we perhaps have a stronger relationship or I know of like, like neighborhood friends and stuff like that. It's kind of like, sometimes we have mm -hmm. to hunt for them, but it, mm -hmm. it definitely helps to have partners in the community for sure. And Salma and Rosanna, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to, um, what about schools and communities that don't have an Arbridge, that don't have a director of community partnerships with a whole team, um, but that are serving immigrant fami families and undocumented families, what are some strategies that you might suggest in that case for how they can reach out to families, um, incorporate them in the program design and delivery and make sure that their needs are being met? Um, who might they reach out to in the community if there's not an R bridge or how can they successfully reach families and make sure that they are being heard? Well, one of the, one of the partners that I know most of the um, districts have is a United Way. So United Ways holds a lot of the information from organizations that are working in different topics in the community. So I will encourage, even if you don't have a whole organized partnership department, but if you do have social workers or you have uh, counselors, if you have family advocates or even assistant principals who cool, cool do these, uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to get any more jo jobs on, 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 your, on your roles, um, but the whole purpose is to create partnerships in the community. So you don't need, you don't need a, an organized department to do so, but you do need people with certain characteristics, which is love and passion for a community and people who genuinely want to help all children. So those, those are two characteristics that I will say you will definitely need um, under your team. You can call it whatever role you want to call it. CIS coordinators have done this in the past. As long CTE coordinators do this too. As long as you have a robust group of people under your team, in your team, who are building partnerships on a regular basis, because the trick here is build partnerships. Know what your needs are and align your partnerships to support those needs and the goals of your district. But you have to do this on a regular basis. You cannot wait until you have an emergency situation to, to start building that partnership. That will be my advice. So reach out to those staple organizations in your community, um, your CIS, United Ways, um, other organizations that you know that are networks of organizations and start getting involved in uh, what, what they are doing in their communities so you start also building those relationships. Yeah, I have um, very, I can, I could talk about this all day long, right? My whole, my whole job revolves around how to build relationships with our parents and our community. Um, and if anyone ever, ever wants to know about how Arbridge did it or how we were able to establish relationships, anyone can reach out to me. I'd be happy to chat. But I think one of the main ways that we've been able to do that is hire or bring in people from that community. 
Um, so as a Latina, I, I find it very naturally and very easy to create relationships with our Latino parents. Um, I, I know the expectations, how to talk to them. I know a lot of the similar experiences. As a daughter of undocumented immigrants, like I, I know very similar things that we've been through and I can relate to them and their stories. Um, but we have a lot of Nepali students. And so hiring a Nepali uh, staff member was so important to our work because she had outreach in her community, um, as well as bringing in community leaders from those communities and having them you know, at our events, translating, making sure that the families feel seen and heard by us and their stories. Um, so having also like Arabic staff and our staff that speak Arabic and staff from Tigre staff, staff that speak Tigrinya and all these different languages. Um, that's one of the main ways that we've been able to build and establish relationships with these communities so that when parents are walking into our center, they see themselves reflected in our staff as much as our students do. Um, so that's been one of the main ways that we've been able to do it as well as, you know, I tell people, a lot of people, language barrier is a huge thing, but you don't need language to connect to people. And so making sure also that the parents just know that you're here and you're there. And sometimes that's as easy as a phone call and being like, hey, like, you know, I just want you to know that I'm here for you. And that has, to me, made the hugest impact with all of our families, no matter where they're from, what culture they, they have or anything. Um, and so those are my two recommendations is making sure that your, your families know that you care about them and that you're here for them. And also, you know, trying as hard to make connections with community leaders in the community or hiring people from that community. Um, and like Rosanna said, there are things you have to look for, obviously, in someone like they have to be passionate. I believe they have to be somewhat outgoing um, or have a very personable or be very personable, um, but different things, different strategies like that. Thank you so much to the both of you. Um, I really like the focus on if there's not an organization, you can go informally to members of your community and even better if you bring them on your staff. Yeah. Um, and in the chat, there was a, someone sent in a, a, a resource from Boulder Food Rescue on how to develop a participatory network involving clients and in program development. Um, so please do check that out uh, and we'll send it out as follow up. So thank you, Lauren, for sending that. I think we have one last question here um, for Salma. Since you are working directly with undocumented families, I'm not sure um, if you're aware of the pandemic EBT program that has come out um, and provides a benefit to families um, that kind of compensates for the school meals loss that they are experiencing during school closures. Are you finding that the undocumented families in your, that you work with are aware of PEBT benefits? And are they aware that the benefit is not considered in that public charge asset test? Um, I, so a lot of our families have reached out to me and asked me about the program. I think um, uh, teachers and the schools have made a lot of families aware of it, but they're not really too certain about what it is, how to get it. Um, they've had a lot of questions about it. Um, and so I'm actually joining a call tomorrow to learn more about it myself so I can answer a lot of those questions for our families. But um, I would say, I mean, that's always a huge fear. Ever since the public charge rule came out, we made it an effort to make sure that our families were aware and informed about it. Um, and so ever since then, we've seen an increased fear and even just relying on the government for any sort of support. And, that's, and that fear is valid and it makes a lot of sense. Um, and we have, you know, talking to our families and, and making sure that they feel safe in applying for benefits for their kids is a huge step that we have to take. Mm -hmm. Um, because we know that, you know, fear is real and the, you know, just kind of not understanding things is important. Um, and I, I know that schools and teachers have made a huge effort to check in with parents as well. I know a lot of teachers are calling families, making sure they're fed and taking care of their needs first. And so, you know, just joining in that, Arbridge is just trying to join in on those efforts um, and educating our families about um, CMS have, um, have created a lot of communication pieces and shared with families about how to apply and even uh, Susan Susan can correct me on this but um, nutrition um, created also different pieces to let families know that they could still apply for free and reduced lunch because some somehow the PEBT it is linked to the free and reduced lunch application so we've done the most that we can to let family know I've been on several uh, webinars and Zoom and Facebook Lives, letting families know, share it on Facebook. And our, our, our call center have received several questions, again, from parents as well. So we've done the best that we can to inform um, about the, this opportunity. And Rosanna, that's correct. 
With our um, applications, uh, we do have an online process, both Spanish and English. So we have been seeing an increase in um, applications as well. So and they're processed daily. Awesome. Um, I think that we could keep talking for another couple hours here, um, but I do want to be mindful of time and just I'm so grateful to everyone um, who joined today. If Colin asked such great questions, um, I promise you we will get all of this in the follow-up out to you in your inbox. Um, but a real sincere thank you to our panelists who have shared such amazing um, stories about the work that they're doing and are just absolute rock stars for their community. So thank you a million times over for all that you do um, in North Carolina and for sharing it and inspiring all of us here on the call today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.